I, I want to know what the expectation is. And so if I'm constantly looking at those five uh, dimensions and saying, did I do that? Did I do that? It's just so much easier for me to deliver because it is a goal. It's like, here's what we want you to accomplish. So you guys remember in the same way the student success funnel can be applied anywhere on campus where you're managing a group of students. How do you find them? How do you see them? How do you solve problems? How do you measure? The same thing is going to be true for these dimensions, right, Matt? Whether we're talking about advising or career or well-being services or success coaching, any place you're having that engagement with students, these are the five dimensions that they're going to be consciously or subconsciously assessing, right? Welcome, everybody. I am Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources, joined today by our president, Matt Boisbear. Hey, Matt. Hello. Hi. You guys have joined us for Cap and Gown, episode 60, which is about assessing your service culture. Um, Matt, I yes. can't believe that you made it back to Texas. <laughs> what time did you the, have to leave this morning? I got the early flight. Um, I think my flight was just at eight o'clock, but in order to get through the Atlanta airport, had wanted to make sure I got there right on time and didn't miss it. You know, Rachel, um, you always give me a hard time about what time to get to the airport, and I've never had a problem. Miss, yeah. well, I've missed one plane, but but uh, on the way to Atlanta, I almost missed my flight. So. Um, I wanted to make sure I did not miss the flight so I could get back in time for yeah. today. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> Housekeeping things, you guys. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. I cannot believe that we are already into December. Um, Lillian was walking around the house the other day, like three days ago, singing it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And I was like, it's too early. And then I was like, oh, wait, it's really not too early, even though it's 80 degrees in Texas. Right. So. We are headed towards the Christmas season. Um, you guys remember that we do our spotlight sessions for our clients in the spring. So if you want to sign up for those, they're awesome. Just a way to have a little bit of dedicated time every week to think about and retweak things in your system. So we're getting ready to launch that. Look for an email about it. Also, our fall release is texting. And so if you are interested in adding texting to uh, Fair360, love to talk to you about that. We're really, really excited about it. Awesome. I can hardly wait for it to get in your hands. So that will be really fun. Matt, anything you want to add before we go on to State of the Union? Well, I just came from the SACS COC uh, conference, and that was exciting. So for uh, Southern states that are accredited by SACS, that that was a uh, really great. It was just a great time to see. We have a lot of clients that are um, uh, accredited by SACS. And so it's just really it's great. It's always to fun have when them. they stop by and get to, you get to see them. And Rebecca Davis <clears throat> um, went with you. And yeah. so that's fun because she got to meet some of our clients that she hadn't met before. So always a good time uh, to be able to spend and learn at that conference. Okay. I have some doozies for you guys today about State of the Union. So <clears throat> the first one I want to talk about, this is not a doozy. This is just a normal. Call them a doozy. <laughs> Your doozies. Um, this is one of the student voice surveys. So, you know, they do these occasionally on different topics. This one is um, what students want and need out of internships. And I wanted to highlight this because, Matt, you and I have talked so many times about how vital internships are for students. Not only as they're choosing and confirming their major, but as they're getting set up for success, um, oftentimes there's some unevenness in how students know how to get internships, who they know, who they're connected to. And so it's really a focus of how do we help our students succeed in internships? So I would um, suggest that you guys read the whole article. It's really helpful. But the top things that students wanted in order to help them succeed in internships were <clears throat> Number one, offer financial assistance for students who can't afford to work for free. 
And that is such an equity and inclusion issue, right? We have students who are like, I don't have the luxury of not having a job and just having an internship with the, where they don't pay me. So can I have a grant or a scholarship to cover that so that I can have that experience? Second, provide guidance on networking in person and remotely. And I feel very confident that it, and remotely had just been added in the last two years, right? We were right. not thinking about that <clears throat> before COVID. Um, offer workshops on succeeding in-person and virtual internships. Provide an internship checklist of things to keep in mind. So this I love is like, let's give you the expertise of what you should be looking for when you're looking for an internship. And then provide guidance on setting up goals for an internship, which um, there's just something about articulating, here's what I would like to achieve, here's how I'm going to know that I've gained the skills that I expected from this internship that I think is powerful uh, for students to be able to do that. So really interesting article there. And I know that's near to your heart because that's your first work in higher education was Career Center, right? <clears throat> uh, and I just think that, you know, I think it's so important. Uh, so many schools are now using Handshake. Um, and so just what they're saying is just access to a tool is not what they need. They right. actually need mentoring, this guidance that you would engage the student and lead them through the process because, um, just giving them a tool without the, the preparation and that career readiness is not, that is not a solution. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because there's kind of a companion piece in this survey that says, what do you wish your college would do more of or a better job to help you find and win an internship? And it's partner with local companies to offer internships, partner with organizations that help students find internships, and then partner with local companies on developing pathways to, to hire former interns, which, you know, we love because so many of the people that we work with started out as interns. And we're yeah. awesome. And then we were just like, what do we do so that we can keep you forever? I think we made a list the other day and it's astounding 40. Yeah, how many interns we've had and then how many of those have translated into full-time employees. So we love that. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great thing to offer. Internships is great. Um, one thing that comes out of this is like uh, unpaid internships. And that's just a no, don't do that. Yeah. You're not going to get the best and it's not going to be, you're not going to value them and they're not going to have a great experience. So paying for interns is one of my pet peeves. You need to do yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Here's one, here's one of the doozies. Are you ready? Yeah. This one stresses me out and I hope our CIO is not listening because it will stress him out too. Okay. Here's the press release. <clears throat> a limited number of grades on quizzes and assignments, but not end of the semester grades, just so we're clear, were changed following a glitch, just a glitch, just a little glitch, in a website used by the University of Maine at Augusta. The error provided 242 students with administrative access to the Brightspace Learning Management System to be able to go in and change their grades. So they found out about this because a student yeah. told them like, hey, I don't know if you know, but everybody can go in and change their grades. And it's okay because they track them all down and don't worry, they all got changed back and they can tell who did everything and all of that kind of stuff. But I would just like to hear the actual unfolding of that event on that campus, right? Well, this is, yeah, this is like, right. Like one student finds out and then calls their friend and then they tell their friend and then who, what are you changing? And, you know, sheesh. And you know, it, it was that one student who was getting like acing all the exams that was like, wait a minute. Yeah, that's what I told you, Matt. I said, I'm pretty sure that Lillian, my daughter would be the one to go and tell and be like, I changed my grade from an A to a C because I didn't feel like I mastered this stuff, but I think other people are changing their, <laughs> their grades higher. So um, yeah, it's pretty scary. There's 5,000 students at the school. So it was a small, small number, but I just would love to hear the, like how it went through the rumor mill that, Hey, quick, go on to the LMS. You can change your grades and your quizzes. That's a nightmare. Okay, another article that I would um, suggest you read all of, it's called um, The Midlife Crisis's Evil Younger Brother, The Quarter Life Crisis. 
The midlife crisis is so passe, it has been superseded by the quarter life crisis when many 20 somethings undergo a rough trouble transition into the real world of early adulthood. So Matt, you and I started seeing this with our interns years ago where wow. I would have interns come into my office and be like, I'm having a quarter life crisis. And I was like, it's not a crisis. It's just hard. Like, it's just what feels overwhelming because you're about to graduate and you have to kind of decide what's going to happen. Um, yeah. So this article talks a lot about how students are really struggling because some of the like mainstays of adulthood are being pushed later. They're not living on their own. They're not getting jobs. They're not getting married. Some of those things, but really what I wanted to talk about in this article is that they go through five things that a campus can do that can help support students who are experiencing their quarter life crisis. First of all, recognize and reward faculty and staff who engage in mentoring. You and I have talked about that many times. How do you incentivize people to spend time on the things that are important, like that relationship rich culture, right? Incentivize departments to enhance engagement initiatives for majors and minors. So how do you work with those students that you've been given to connect with them all through their time, uh, all four years? Place as many students as possible into cohort programs where they have access to a dedicated mentor. We have said that over and over. The honors college framework works for everyone. So how do we break our students into these smaller populations and give them a person? Expand programs that promote student faculty interaction. Yep, that's what collisions at hours is about, right? And visiting hours and all those things we've been talking right. about. And then integrate and infuse personal development across the curriculum. So this is student development. This is making sure we're looking at our students and we're providing that just in time mentorship when they need it, not just about academic issues, but about all of the issues that are uh, that are facing them. So I would really recommend that article. I think I think the conclusions drawn are the right ones. Um, but also it's interesting just to read about how students are really struggling with this overwhelming feeling of they're not equipped, right, to step out into yeah. their life. Good. So that, that's <clears throat> okay, highly recommended. See. It's pretty much everything yeah. you've been talking about this. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Okay, the GAO, which is the Government Accountability Office, which I've been reading Harry Potter, and that sounds very much like a Harry Potter kind of an office, right? The Government Accountability Office. They just blasted most colleges for failing to tell students how much their education will actually cost them. Okay, so the Government Accountability Office, which I would like to know what else they do, like are they holding everyone accountable for everything? Oh yeah, I think. Or just think higher so. education, or? No, I think they're. That's their business, making sure you're. Okay. I'm gonna have to dig into that a little bit, but they just did a study of 176 unnamed colleges to see if they were following the 10 best practices in the field for award letters. What are the 10 best practices, you might ask? What are they, Rachel? Let me, I'm glad you asked. Okay. So um, we're going to chat this to you. This comes from the GAO. It's like, a, it's kind of like a dear colleague letter where they go through and they're like, here's what we expect you to do in your award letters. Number one, itemize key direct and indirect costs. So you have to tell students so they can budget for both direct costs, tuition and fees, as well as books, transportation. So you need to put that in your award letter. You need to provide the total cost of attendance that includes all key costs. Again, students need to know the total cost of what it takes to go to your, to your school. Estimate the net price by subtracting gift aid from key costs. Separate gift aid, loans, and work study. Students should immediately be able to recognize the different types of aids that they're getting. Do not include a parent plus loan, or if included, separate and differentiate it from students' loans because they have a lot of different uh, kind of things that apply to them, and so you need to understand that separate. Label the type of aid. Students should easily be able to see grants, loans, and work study being offered. Label the source of aid, federal, state, institutional, or private, because there are going to be protections and stipulations to each of those things. Include actionable next steps. So what do we do? We accept, we decline, we ask for an adjustment. <clears throat> Eight, 
uh, no, nine, highlight key details and distinctions about loans, grants, and work studies. So you need to understand that a loan has to be paid back, a scholarship, you might have an academic requirement, work study is not guaranteed. And then finally, do not refer to the offer as an award. Students should know that loans and work study are not awards because they have to be repaid or earned through employment. So those are the 10 best practices in your award letter. Here's what's crazy. Of the 176 colleges, nearly two thirds of the colleges follow half or fewer of the 10 wow. best practices. No college in the sample followed all 10. And only 3% followed nine of those best practices. So they estimate 50% of colleges understate the net price. Many colleges exclude key costs and factor in loans that have to be repaid. Doing this makes a college appear less expensive than it actually is. This is coming about because they want to pass new legislation that's going to say, like, this is the standard aid letter that you have to give. Um, and there's a lot of talk of like, hey, but we could just do this. We don't have to have legislation. We could just all agree that we could, you know, follow these best practices. Go ahead. Well, this just kind of reminds me of the sticker on a car that that became very standardized and it has to have this yes. information, the miles per gallon in city and on <laughs> a highway and right. So, yeah. so the standardization, especially when you're trying to reach an 18 year old or uh, parents who've never uh, have any experience with college and how to make sense of it. So I think that's all good. I was, I was, as you were talking, I was just going through the checklist on my son's award letter and yeah. I see where, yeah, I see where they didn't hit all 10. They, they might have nine, but, but they hit the important ones. So, well, here's the problem with this. I think is that if we don't all agree what we're going to deliver in those aid packages, then you really are comparing apples and oranges. And it's actually, uh, besides your moral character, it is actually to your advantage to make that opaque. Because if yeah. you have people looking at the two award letters and this person is telling you everything about it, and then this person is making it opaque, this one looks better. And in fact, the politician who wrote this legislative piece said, when I decided to go to college, I had a award from a private institution and then an out-of-state public institution. And I looked at them and I was super confused. And she's like, my dad made a spreadsheet that did all 10 of these things. Yeah. And she said, and I realized that actually out-of-state tuition for this public institution was still going to be $20,000 cheaper than this oh. private institution. Isn't that interesting? So that wasn't sort of her gut check, but then after they did apples to apple, apples, that's what she found out. So it'll be interesting to see yeah. what happens there. Well, work study is like if if I'm just gonna uh, again get on a high horse about something when you're when you're weaving work study in, because I saw this unfold with a family where they were looking at at this and they couldn't quite understand when yeah. they showed up at campus, they thought it was going to cost this much. And then they were told, oh, no, that's work study. You actually have to work and then choose to apply it. To and also, not everybody who's eligible for work study, we don't have enough jobs, right? Because that was the other piece is like, oh, yeah, we have all these students who are eligible, but then we don't actually have positions uh, for you to have them. So I think, I think to your point about the car label, I think that just makes sense. Um, but yeah. I think even before the laws are passed, it would be a really good thing to invest in for sure. Do you have more to say about that? No. Okay. Okay. This last one, <clears throat> you guys remember this crazy town business that I talked about last week. I almost had a come apart because <laughs> schools are partnering with betting, like yeah, making deals. Like we want kickbacks. We're going to give you this information or this access to this, these betting like apps. Okay, so Dave Ramsey on his show, I quote, he said, you freaking idiots selling out your own students who you are supposed to be caring for when the number two addiction in North America today and fastest growing addiction in North America today is online gambling. It starts with sports betting as a gateway drug. So he is like 
how can you say that you are going to care for and support these students and sell them to these online gambling companies? Um, I don't know if you saw, so we talked about two institutions. It's actually at least eight institutions have made this partnership for kickbacks. Wow. The risk for gambling addictions has grown 30% from 2018 to 2021 with the risk concentrated among young males, 18 to 24, who are sports bettors. So this is coming about because the Supreme Court overturned a decision that limited sports betting to Nevada. And so now there are 31 states where it's legal. And so obviously these apps are like, we just want to gobble up as much of that as we can. But when you think about this vulnerable population that is growing addicted to gambling, and then they're being spoon fed it by their institutions for a kickback, it is unbelievable to me. Like well, we're I talking feel like about we... two weeks in a row because I still can't believe that's real life. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like you covered all of that ground last week, and I'm glad that Dave Ramsey's listening to you. I'm sure that's that's where he <laughs> got like, his that's information. That's outrageous. <laughs> and yeah, it is outrageous. Um, okay, well, so... listen, here's my question for you. The average okay. debt generated by a man addicted to gambling, what do you think the answer is to that? The average de debt generated by a man addicted to gambling. Well. I'm going to, I think it's big. I'm I'm going to give you a big number. And so maybe like, if this is price is right, I'm going to get blown out. Okay. Well, based on your reaction. I don't we'll know. I, like, I, I think it's like $15,000. I, I think it's a, no, that's too Was high. that your big number? No, I actually cut it down. Oh, listen, Matt. The average, which this range is weird. Is it to 35? Me, so is it 35? That was going to be my number. No. It's between 55,000 and 90,000, which that range, I don't really understand. It's like this or double this, right? Somewhere in there. But still, that's I, insane. Okay. I mean, I well, need to settle down. I'm getting a little bit upset. Okay. Same question for yeah, women. It kind of reminded me of, of when you're like, it's between six and 10 and, and the student yeah. was like. One time I was doing a workshop and I was like, how many careers do recent college graduates expect to have in their lifetime? And so all these people tried to answer. And then I was like, it's between six and eight. And this little boy in the front row raised his hand so happily. And he was like, seven, it's seven. <laughs> that is between six Got and it. eight. Got it. Got it. Okay. But listen, Women. we know that we know that that gambling can destroy everything. Like, can destroy your life. It's it's yeah, if you graduated with up? with college debt as well as ninety thousand dollars in gambling debt, I don't know I what you do. Right. Yeah, I, I have no idea what you do. Women, All right. average fifteen thousand. Oh, so just just saying. Yeah. I can okay, you that. guys. That is the state of the union. Um, I wanted to tell you, so let's see, next week is our last episode before Christmas break and we will be back January 10th. So I'm sure January 10th, I will have a lot to tell you about the state of the union because things tend to accumulate um, when we take time off. But today we are talking about assessing service culture. And Matt, very much like you were last week when I was like, hey, this is my wheelhouse. Stick with me. I'm going to teach you motivational interviewing. Sure. This week, I was like, what do you do, Matt? What do you know about? <laughs> and you were like, I, I know about this thing. So this is your show. I am along for the ride. And I would love for you to guide us through assessing service culture. Okay. Well, let's not set it up that way because, you know, I, Yeah. I will depend on you to, to Rachel's really great at telling me we got to land the plane and move on. Matt. So <laughs> I expect that you'll continue to do that. Service excellence is something that I'm really passionate about. I actually got a degree in this thing. And so um, the, the area for me of thinking about, so, so the why service excellence matters and why would we talk about it today is that um, your service culture can have a significant impact in the student experience, 
student satisfaction. It's one of the reasons why a student would be loyal and say, that's, that's where I want to be. They care for me. And so um, when I think about like our two parts, like what you bring for our clients and, and then um, my, my side of service excellence, this is a thing that I am really passionate about. And it's really hard. It's like, well, how do you take your, I forget how thick your book was. How do you take <laughs> something that you spent years studying and yeah. boil it down to one session? I don't know that, that uh, you can, but I, but I hope today just talking about service excellence can, can um, generate some ideas, um, hopefully encourage uh, our listeners and, but also um, create some opportunities for better engagement with students. So. Yeah, um, I like this because it is both theoretical. Here is a framework for you to be able to understand what your students are telling you and also incredibly actionable because you can ask your students using this language, what's going on with you, right? So yeah. can, can you start us with um, the promise triangle? It's kind of the way where we look at what's happening on an institution, right? Yeah. So I always start when I, when I talk about service culture, I'm always going to start with the service, uh, the promise triangle. And, and so if you're uh, sitting there and you have a pen, just, just make three dots, make a triangle at the top of the triangle is your institution. That's, that's your school and administration. And I would kind of capture it as like all the marketing, all the communication that happens from the school um, but but also all of the systems uh, that that's that the school is uh, communicating. Um, then you have another point, which is the student. And uh, you could probably put a little dash and, and say um, the parents there, too. And then the third point on this triangle is you, uh, your staff and faculty. And so this service uh, promise triangle is is really about the relationship between these three different points. So I do this all right? of the, yeah, that's great. Yep. Got it. Great. So you have the interaction between the institution and the students and that we call making promises. It's all the work that goes on. So like all the, the your view book and all that admissions does and says about your institution and why students should come. Okay. And then you have the interaction between the institution, administration, and faculty and staff, and we call that enabling the promise. And so that's that piece of like, all, all are they giving you what you need to be uh, successful in your work? But what we're really going to focus on today is this bottom piece, which is interaction between staff and faculty and students. And we call this the moment of truth. This is the delivery of the promise. So every time you engage with a student, um, this exchange is a moment of truth. It's where the student is assessing, do I belong here? Are they on my team? Is this a good, good place for me? So really powerful. And um, so there's, there's a lot that we, we want to unpack on that. Yeah. So that idea of this, like excellent engagement, excellent relationships, so key to everything we talk about all the time, right? It's really at the heart of student success. Do I see you and can I help provide a solution for this problem that you're, you're talking about? And Matt, I think I was, I was thinking about how Starbucks calls that um, customer connections, right? That you are seen and then also we give you the right drink or this idea of moment of truth. It is in that, that minute when you and I are looking at each other, are we present and are we providing good service and support, right? That's really what we're talking about. Yeah. So, and we can go into a lot of depth on that. So um, I think, I think that, so again, moment of truth, this is, this is really important for your team to understand that, that every encounter that you have uh, really is a moment of truth experience for that student might not be for you. Um, you might not have seen it that way, but they are, especially if they're coming in to your office and they're stressed and they're trying to figure out how to how to make this work. Um, you know, when you think about all these times that a student might come in with high anxiety, um, it's yeah, definitely sure. a moment of truth. So I think um, for me, where like the light bulb went off, where my background, we saw this really unfold when we were on a campus. And you and I have talked about this a little bit, but we love meeting with students. And we were on a campus and just talking with students about 
their experience. And they started to tell us like, overall, they love their school. Um, there's a lot of things that they love about their peers, about in the classroom, but then they started to talk about specific experiences in different offices that were there supposedly to support the students, right? Uh, financial aid would be one of those big ones. Advising was another one. And that's where it really, like I said, the light bulb went off and it's like, okay, so how do we improve that service exchange or that moment of truth engagement that they're having? Um, and, and, I, and I saw this um, unpack uh, at, at uh, an institution that I, that I worked at, the first job that I had in the advising office. It was um, kind, of, kind of shocking that in, in this advising office, so before I came in, we had new advisors, but the, the satisfaction with advising was a D. It was, it was below 70%. You were giving like fact. student surveys and they- So they... at the end of the year, students would fill out, you know, kind of their student satisfaction survey overall for the for the college. And, and they were giving the advising experience. Everything else was great. Advising, they gave a D. And so when I came in, it's, well, we need to, we need to really focus on this. So, um, so yeah. So Matt, I'm just thinking about the bigger context. I was just reading an article um, today that said, Basically, students' expectation about the level and quality of their support services has increased. Students increasingly believe those services are as important as academic quality. Sorry, can I say that one more time? That as huge. those services are as important as academic quality. That is directly coming out of COVID where we solved the academic issue, but the service issue, we had a lot more difficulty uh, solving. And so I think there's gonna be an increased pressure on excellent service on our campuses because these students coming in have a much higher expectation than, than I did. I wasn't thinking about service. Like I just, I had to wade my way through college, right? I, I didn't have an expectation that I, someone was gonna be helpful to me. These students do. Well. I think their experience of of essentially those services being taken away from them, uh, not being able to access it when they had to go home and and while they were um, uh, virtual during right. COVID, and so now they're coming back to campus and I think they they're valuing it more as you're yeah. as you're talking about. So so again, I think that's why this is a hot topic. So using these dimensions to know how you're delivering on your promise, basically we're saying once you understand the dimensions, you need to be asking your students, how did we do on these things, right? That it could just become like a ubiquitous language where I know that I am going to be graded by my students on these five things that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, measuring student satisfaction in, in each of your areas, the, if you're going to do it, highly recommend using these dimensions. So this comes from ServeQual, uh, which is really clever, uh, you know, short version of service quality. <laughs> but but ServeQual uh, identified five dimensions. And what's powerful about this is you could apply this to anywhere you go and receive a service. Like uh, we we subconsciously use these five dimensions in evaluating how that restaurant was or, um, you know, that airline or getting a haircut. Like these these are dimensions that we're we're just assessing all the time. I think that the best application of this is like the DMV. Like I think we should just be thinking about like actually the worst service experience you have. I don't know what I, I always have a bad time at the DMV, but like wherever the place is that you need a thing and you walk away thinking wow that was awful. How about right? trying to get your passport when you're wanting to go on vacation and it's oh, taking forever? Oh gosh, you know? this happened to our friend Brayden and it was just like, yeah, the worst service experience ever. So I like to juxtapose those, right? Where you're like, hey, this is what it looks like if it's good. Think back to a time where you had a terrible experience and you will go through this whole list and be like, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. They didn't do that, right? Okay, so- let so, me set it up. Okay. Five dimensions. Um, it- it kind of spells out if if you're taking note, it just spells out Rater, R A T E R. Oh, I so like a good. Is that an easy, acronym? I don't know what it is. I think it's an acronym. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, acronym. So the first one, the first R, reliability, and then okay. A, assurance. T is tangibles, 
E is empathy, which we've talked a lot about, um, mm-hmm. but this has specific measures. And then responsiveness. So uh, those are the five dimensions. And and these are the five things that when I went into that advising office, I started, I put together a survey. And every time a student came into that office, um, I sent them the survey and I was asking specific questions around these five dimensions. And at the time, my my new advising team was not very happy about this idea that every interaction was going to be uh, surveyed, but the students loved it. And then when we started to get the responses in, the advisors would come in and, and they were eager to see, did I get a five? Did I get a five? Now they know these are the five things that are really important. So Okay. I really love that measurement piece because I I want to know what the expectation is. And so if I'm constantly looking at those five uh, dimensions and saying, did I do that? Did I do that? It's just so much easier for me to deliver because it is a goal. It's like, here's what we want you to accomplish. So you guys remember in the same way the student success funnel can be applied anywhere on campus where you're managing a group of students. How do you find them? How do you see them? How do you solve problems? How do you measure? The same thing is going to be true for these dimensions, right, Matt? Whether we're talking about advising or career or well-being services or success coaching, any place you're having that engagement with students, these are the five dimensions that they're going to be consciously or subconsciously assessing, right? Yep. All right. So let's let's drill into each dimension. So reliability is the ability to perform the promised service dependably and accurately. And before we dive into higher ed, I just want you to think about your latest encounter. Uh, you know, when you when you went to Starbucks, how reliable is Starbucks? Hey, listen, what? I have to tell you a side story about reliability. This morning, I went to Starbucks to get my coffee, which is a coffee with an act, like two shots. I saw it sitting at the thing. I said to the woman, Hey, that's my coffee. And she said, I'm really sorry. I gave your coffee to the customer beforehand. This is a kid's hot chocolate, which is what the kid ordered, but I gave him your coffee. That is not very reliable. And that poor teacher who had that kid in class, who had my double shot latte was very unhappy with Starbucks not being reliable in that way. Right. Yeah. So that's great. Okay. So let's, (laughs) <laughs> Let's just assess this situation at Starbucks, but also in, in your advising center or when you're um, uh, providing success coaching, reliability. Uh, when you promise to do something by a certain time, you do it. Okay. Okay. Um, also, showing a sincere interest in solving a need. Uh, performing student services right the first time. So there's where you're you're, the first time that mom will never order hot chocolate for that kid again. <laughs> um, also providing student services, uh, providing them at the time that you promise to do so. So there's reliability. And, and I think that's really important, uh, right there, right? So are we reliable? Can you rely on us to do what we said we were going to do at the time that we said we were going to do it? Um, and we're going to make it, we're, we're going to perform it right the first time. So Matt, okay. I'm just thinking about so many students that I advised who lost hundreds of dollars because they were not advised in a reliable way. And it was like, you took math 120, but that doesn't count for a business major. So now you can count that as an extra credit, like a uh, elective, but you've got to take 130 again, Right. That, especially in advising, is just the worst uh, waste of money and not, and then students are nervous because they can't trust what you're telling them because you've already made a mistake. And they're like, well, how do I know that what you're saying is the right thing this time? Right. Yeah. So that you're, you're keeping good records of everything. That's, that's really important. Like, Hey, I attended that. Well, I didn't mark, you're not marked as attending. Well, but I was there you know, so, um, okay. So that's reliability. The next is assurance, the knowledge and courtesy of employees and their ability to convey trust and confidence. Um, so this, you can break this down that your employees will instill confidence in your students, that students will feel safe in their transactions with your team, that you're, uh, consistently courteous to your students 
and that you have the knowledge to answer the questions that students ask. Yeah. Okay. So I see this one so often. This is the language that I use about like, hey, stick with me. I'm really good at this. If yeah. you will just stick with me through this process, we can check things off the list and, and you can have confidence. We um, listen to a speaker, Chase Hughes, who talks about lending your confidence to somebody else. And it's especially relevant when they don't feel a sense of belonging. Like, I'm not sure I belong here. I'm not sure this is the right place. I have that imposter syndrome that you mm -hmm. can, by providing assurance, you can actually lend them confidence that you are in the right place. Stick with me. We can get through this, right? Yeah, it's good. All right. So that's assurance, reliability, assurance. The next is tangibles. Tangibles is the appearance of your facilities, your equipment your personnel and your communications materials. And you know, this is like my favorite one. When we, we go visit a campus, camp. I'm taking pictures. Um, we, everything speaks is what we talk about. Like, so are you conveying um, high quality in, in everything that you're providing to a student? So when you hand a student your, uh, their degree plan, is it a quality degree plan? Does it look quality? So um, that that everything's modern looking, your facilities are visually appeal appealing, employees have a professional appearance, and materials associated with your services are visually appear appealing. Do you have some examples of that? Yeah, I have a lot. So, so one thing that really stood out when I was in this advising office is our student workers were copying degree plans and they were copying them crooked on a little salmon colored piece of paper and it's like these are this is the four year plan for this freshman it's going to cost you tens them, of thousands of dollars right and when you hand them a photocopy of a crooked degree plan what are you telling them um another example is is handing out like diplomas that have the the you know cum laude sticker crooked on, on it and um yeah. so cheap cheap degree uh, uh, diplomas. So um, you know, Matt, I think of tangibles as a, as a thing where it's like, when you walk into a place, you're trying to assess, should I be here or not? You know what I mean? Like this happens with the restaurant where you walk in and you're like, I don't know if I want to eat yeah. here or not. Right. Um, that's a really interesting, like, like you are assessing for the tangibles of what do the tables look like and what is the atmosphere and is the place clean and all of those things, even though you might not articulate it in that way. So in, in my old college of business where I used to work, there was a stairwell, three floors, and it was dingy and, and it was just kind of grimy, dingy. All, every student had to walk up and down this stairwell. And so this is great, a great opportunity to tell the story of um, what's going on in this in this building. So we transformed that stairwell. Today, you walk in it, you'll see pictures of students who did internships, of alum, where they work, what the key stats are uh, for placement, but also key experiences that students are going to have while they're enrolled in, in the uh, program. So so we took this dingy thing that the tangible evidence of like what's going on here, it smelled and it was not great, transformed it into an, an awesome, as you walk through, like every day I have confidence this is going to be worth my time here. So well, it Matt, really it's neat. interesting because I also think about that, like we talked about last week in holding space, that that you took what was in essence like a nothing, like like no meaning in this stairwell, right? And then you were like, I'm going to actually use this space to provide tangible evidence of the value of what you're doing here, which I love yeah. that. Yeah. <clears throat> Is this worth $40,000 a year? You know? Yeah. That's yeah. kind of an important. So tangibles help convey to a student. Yeah, it is. It also, tangibles are a way of reinforcing these other pieces like uh, reliability and, and assurance, right? That I have this thing that I don't know, but this degree plan is telling me I have a future, right? Yeah. So um, it's really, tangibles are really powerful. Okay, after tangibles, empathy. 
Uh, empathy, we talk a lot about. So, you know, giving like a definition of empathy, um, I think our people know, but the provision of caring, individualized attention to students. Um, it's, it's which I'm just going to interrupt you and say, remember our belonging cues of energy, yeah. individualization, and future thinking. And that is really what we're talking about here, where it's like, I see you and I'm going to give you what you need, not what every student needs, right? So that's that's so huge. Like showing empathy to a student is, is saying like, I'm going to give you individualized personal attention. Yeah. That, I mean, let's just start there. Um, it It is, uh, I think, a... a Another way of, of thinking about empathy is things like your your office hours. When do you operate? Are you thinking about the student or are you thinking about someone else? Um, are you thinking about your own needs? So uh, having your employees understand the specific needs of their students is really important. When a student comes into financial aid, most likely they're going to be stressed. You need to know that your team needs to be thinking about, hey, let's just really listen to them. Let's take time to listen to them. Not, oh yeah, here's another student coming in who's stressed, but why is this student stressed? What's going on in their life that's creating this stress for them? Does that make you sense? Know, yeah. So I have a couple of things to say about that. One thing is I really find with things like empathy that you have to be disciplined about it all the time, not just when students are with you. So I was like this when I worked at an, a university. I don't want to hear a bad thing about students. I don't want to hear how they don't have it together and they didn't do their thing and they should have done that. And they could, I don't want to hear it even when they're not around because yeah. it's our job to help them. So if they come in and they need some help, you must be consistent in that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to be gracious and kind to them. And that sort of two-facedness, I think that sometimes happens where when they're in front of you, you're like, oh my gosh, that's, I'm so sorry. And then they leave and you're like, that student never blah, 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 blah. I just think you have to be disciplined to say, I am going to find empathy for this student, um, whether they're in front of me or they're out of the office. Right. Yeah. Um, also I, your, your comment about operating hours, I was always really surprised when I worked at a university that like eight to five means nothing to students. They don't right. understand Like you get up every morning and go to work at eight and then you come home at five, Like they live on campus. So I would send requests to students like, Hey, come and see me. When are you free? And they're like, Oh, nine 30, I get done with rehearsal or yeah, rehearsal. You think I'm here at nine 30 at night, but they do because that is when it is convenient for them to be able to meet. So maybe not every night advising has to be open late, but if those are times where your non-traditional students or whatever your stu the students are that you're serving, if they are consistently saying, I can come during lunch, then you should be open during lunch, right? Yeah, that was a big wrestle, you know. Um, just hours though, convey, hey, we're, we're here for you. And even if you did exactly what you said, we're just gonna have one day uh, where we're going to make an exception or extend our hours because we have students who need that time. So, um, great. So empathy and the last one are responsiveness. And, um, so this is really, this is really powerful too. So responsiveness is the willingness to help students and to provide prompt service. We've all gone to the restaurant. This just happened to me in Atlanta where, where you see the open tables and, and, uh, like, so like you're waiting to, to be seated and you see the go to the host, go to the host and, and yeah, just table for one. And you see all these open tables and they're like, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be 45 minutes. Okay. So I wait, wait. It just seems like, you know, um, now one, one thing about responsiveness is uh, telling students exactly when services will be performed. So they did tell me 45 minutes, but uh, <laughs> giving prompt service to students, being always willing to help your students. And this is the important thing, never, never being too busy to respond to a student's needs. And um, so the, the things we, we talk about, like how do we show responsiveness 
to a student? Well, when a student walks in, are they greeted right away? Or do they have to like wonder, are they in the right place? Yeah. Or is, is someone going to be able to, to meet with me today? Um, so, I mean, right off the bat, just how they're greeted. I think Chick-fil-A is a great, you know, great model for this, how to, how to do this well, but. Sorry, um, Matt, I just took a whole trip about, um, I mean, sometimes we are too busy to see students, like that's a fact, but I think the application of responsiveness is. John, I am so sorry. My afternoon yeah. is totally full of students, but if you will come back at 4.30, please come back. I would love to help you with that, right? Because even if I can't do it right now, I am saying at the next possible opportunity, I'm setting your expectations and yeah. I'm letting you know, like, I really want you to come. You're not a bother to me. I want to be able to solve this problem for you, right? Now, if you tell them 4.30, then the reliability part would say you better be there when he comes back at 4 30. Yeah. I have he students not, all the way to 4 30, you know, he may not come back, but you should be there. Yeah. Um, I also think part of that is the like, uh, willing to help students and never too busy. That is the walk the student where they need to go. So we just had this, we are on Dominican's campus and yeah. there was a student worker and we were trying to find a thing. And I was like, where's the, this? And she was just like, it was so funny. Cause she was like, they, her face was like, there's no way you will ever find that. I cannot give you directions to that. So she's right. like, come with me. So she like led us through this lamp, a labyrinth of where we wanted to go. And we felt so cared for, so welcome on their campus as we're walking through and she's telling us like, that's the library. There's the, this like down this hallway. I mean, we, we literally never would have found it. Right. But it was an attentiveness to, Hey, I want to be helpful and get you where you need to go. It's a great example. So you were, you were shared this with me, the, how the, this article, um, the student that student support is tied to positive experiences. And if you yeah. just take this Raider, yeah. You want to, talk a little bit about that? Well, I just, th so this is, and I don't think I have the link to this article, so I'll have to, maybe we'll send it out in the follow-up, but it's basically like, Hey, when students have positive support experiences, whether I said like advising or success coaching or well-being or whatever, they are more likely to stay at your institution. And so they have a whole host of things that are really important to student satisfaction, things like technology tools, but services is one of them. And onboarding is another one, which I think is so relevant to this idea of services, like how you welcome them to campus, how you introduce all the different pieces to them, how you make sure that they have what they need in order to be successful. Okay. Those experiences are going to make students more connected to your institution. Um, and they have a higher expectation that you will do that well, right? Yeah, so I, I found it fascinating. So they surveyed students and, and essentially they were asking like, how would you rate your overall experience with your university? And so you had students who said, I have a great experience at my institution. And then you had students who said, I have a really negative experience at my institution. And so this, this broke down these key things like uh, the question, I can, e I can easily get my questions answered at my university. And 78% of students who um, said, I have a uh, great experience at my university said, yeah, I can easily get. Only 24% of students said that if they indicated a negative experience at their institution. Um, what I love about that is, okay, so if I'm trying to understand easily get answers to my questions, I think these five dimensions go right into that, right? So is, is this a reliability issue? Is this an, an assurance issue? Is it tangibles? Like you literally are not providing this in any any place but verbally. So, right. Yeah. So being able to take these uh, five dimensions and apply it to things that you might be hearing from students that they feel negative about. Um, I have the support I need for my university to succeed academically. Well, let's apply this these five dimensions to that. I can easily sign up for an advising appointment at my university. Let's assign these five dimensions and assess why is it that you're saying you can't easily do that? Um, because if we're going to overall Im improve the experience for our students, which leads to greater satisfaction, which leads to loyalty and retention and great alum, then this is a great model for, 
for you to apply. So. So Matt, again, that is just scratching the surface of everything that you can do for a campus with this, uh, with these dimensions, right? So thinking about how are you asking students the right questions? How are you looking at that data? You talk a lot about the gap between what a, a practitioner might think is important. Like, I think students need me to be really, really responsive. And students are like, no, I don't need responsive. I need right, right? Yeah. So being yeah. able to know so, the difference. So assessing specifically, like, what is a student's expectation? And then what's their perception of what they're receiving? So, yeah. so starting there, but then it's really fascinating to ask board members. We've actually done that. Like, what do you think a student would say is important uh, on a campus? And it's a way of bringing the campus together to really understand their students, uh, you know, in a more complete way yeah. and be able to focus in on specific behaviors that we need to change. And that's keeping the student at the center and saying, help me yeah. understand your experience of this thing that we're talking about so that I can address the places where we're not giving an even experience, right? So yeah. that good work, you fit all of that in um, to our <laughs> to our session today. I think there's a lot more conversation about how you assess these things, how you teach these things, um, we've had campuses before who like create a whole service vision and everybody has it on their desk. And here's what we expect in each of these different elements, right? Um, I yeah. think you can reward those things by saying, we're going to look at the scores your students are giving you and, and say, you've done an excellent job in these ways. Um, so I think there's a lot more conversation, but I think having the, the language of those five things to assess our service to our students, but also service in general when we're going places and we need help with something, being able to identify this person doesn't seem like they know what they're talking about. When I walk away from this encounter, it's definitely going to have been done wrong. And the outcome that I need is definitely not going to happen. Right. Have those experiences all the time. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's how like you would, you would collect advisees because they knew that you would deliver. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that language, I think, is really, really helpful. And we just have to figure out, Matt, how to help that um, application on a campus. I mean, the campuses that we've done this with, we've seen incredible transformation. Just having the ability to say, we've got to shore this up and we have a problem here, but we're doing a great job there. So yeah. I think we need to think more about that application, how we can make that a little bit easier for our schools to do. Any final words? Um, I, no, I, I, well, I guess, I guess so. <laughs> just pick two, you know, out of yeah. these five, just pick two, like, and assess. So how are we on tangibles and responsiveness? Uh, most of our schools, they're, they're doing an okay job if they've been listening to you on empathy, but um, do, do students think that we're reliable, right? Um, are we yeah, really I, investing in in assurance with our students? That they, I can't tell they you feel... how many times I had to say to a student, sorry about that advisor. You will have to call them 10 times before they will ever answer you. Right. Could right. we fix that? Because that's not reliable, right? So ultimately, what I like about this in this assessment and starting to bring this up as part of a changing of culture, having a culture of putting students in the center what, what that can lead to on your campus is really powerful and creating this overall uh, vision of we're just we're just going to be excellent in the way that we engage our students. So hopefully this is- In the is moment of truth. I love that. We'll be start. excellent in the yeah. moment of truth, right? Yeah. Great. All right, friends. Thank you guys for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.